All right, we are now recording. Um, again, thank you if you're just joining us. Thank you so much for, for coming to this, our first Feminist Bird Club webinar. Um, I'm gonna dive right into the bios and then pass it along to Molly. So our first guest is gonna be Divya Anantharaman, who is the owner of Gotham Taxidermy and the co-author of the book, Stuffed Animals, A Modern Guide to Taxidermy. She specializes in birds, but works on both artistic and scientific commissions with clients ranging from museums, oddity collectors, and even some celebrities. Um, Kaylee Kepner is a collections assistant in the bird collection at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. Um, she has been at the museum since 2012 and will be leaving this fall to start her master's at Evergreen State College. In addition to working at the museum, Kaylee volunteers with the Chicago Peregrine Program, Chicago Bird Collision Monitors, and Hawk Migration Association of North America. Aurora Crooks has been on the conservation team in New York City Audubon since 2019 as the conservation associate, working both to organize data and volunteers for New York City Audubon's Project Safe Flight, Tribute and Light, and for habitat restoration efforts. Uh, Molly Adams and I are going to be moderating the event and keeping track of questions um, that come in. So for more information on Zoom, how this works, how we're gonna be taking questions, as well as where your donations are going tonight, I will hand it off to Molly. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, hi, my name is Molly. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. Um, and I am the founder and president of the Feminist Bird Club. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here, especially to our panelists. Um, I personally uh, feel like it's pretty hard right now to think about birds. Um, or anything other than police brutality. So uh, I, I hope that other activists who are on this, this Zoom right now can find uh, the next hour to be a thoughtful moment of rest. Uh, and shout out to all the people who emailed me before this saying that they couldn't make it because they're going to protest. So I hope that you stay safe. And just like Francis said, we are recording and this will go to our YouTube later. Um, so uh, thanks to so many of you who added a donation with your ticket. Um, because of you, we were able to raise over $2,500 now for um, Black Visions Collective. And they are a queer and black led group in um, Monta or Minnesota, sorry, in Minneapolis. And, and they are fighting for organizing powerful black communities and dismantling police violence. Um, so thank you so much for su supporting that group. And if uh, any other people out there are, are participating in activism or online actions that they wanna share in the chat, please feel free um, to share with everybody. Um, and like Francis mentioned, we are gonna be monitoring the chat, but please um, keep in mind that if this were an in-person event, you wouldn't have the opportunity to contact or like just call out questions and comments directly to the presenters during their presentations. So um, just keep that in mind um, while you're using the chat so they don't get overwhelmed. Um, but we will be looking through that. And then also if you have a question that you want to ask one of the panelists during the Q&A portion at the end of this, um, please use the special Q&A box, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom screen to the right of the share screen button, or I'm not sure if you see that, but it's a little separate Q&A box. Um, so we'll be able to use that for, for moderating later. Um, and I think that's all the housekeeping. So I'm excited to get started and pass things off to Divya. Hi everybody, so my name is Divya. My pronouns are she, hers, or they, them. And tonight I'm gonna talk to you about the art and science of taxidermy. Um, and how it's an artwork that's been used as a tool to communicate science. So we'll go on a short tour of my home studio through photos, um, and I'll show you a few of my current projects and share a little bit of history and a little bit about the taxidermy process too. And I hope to convince some of you to try taxidermy as well. A lot of the great well, taxidermists and naturalists of yore have been, you know, a lot of great naturalists have been taxidermists like Audubon, for example, except now we could use a lot more people who aren't just old white guys. So please, please be encouraged to try taxidermy. If you have any questions about it afterwards, again, let me know in the Q&A. So taxidermy, as far as what taxidermy is, it comes from the Greek 
taxis, which is to move or arrange, and derma, which is skin. So the taxidermy as a concept is pretty simple. It's mounting a skin that's been cleaned and preserved onto an anatomically accurate form. But the execution can be pretty hard. Each mount is different, but generally the only thing that's real, that the only thing that's real from the animal is just the skin. So with birds particularly, sometimes the head um, is fake, sometimes the feet are fake, there are replicas or replicated, um, the eyes aren't the real eyes. So everything else aside from the skin is, is sculpted. So it requires a really great understanding of anatomy um, and about how an animal moves and how an animal um, moves through its habitat, how it reacts through its habitat, um, how it reacts through different seasons even. So a lot of that, um, a lot of the really, really valuable knowledge about taxidermy um, comes from field observation and knowing animals, which a lot of you, I'm assuming, do since you're here with Feminist Bird Club. Um, a bit of a history about taxidermy is the reason it came about is that before the internet, before um, the advances in photography, Preserved animals are how people learned about animals that didn't live where they were. So these people would go on like expeditions and you know, there was a lot of very, there's a lot of very problematic history and all of that. Um, but these cabinets of curiosities formed based on these animals being collected. And these, those cabinets of curiosities sort of were places where people would exchange things and exchange ideas. And those turned into museums and then those further turned into research collections and that all kind of helped educate different people about the wonders of nature, um, what different animals look like, and, you know, sort of, sort of sharing, you know, sharing that wonder with, with the public. So it's hard to pin down when, when, what the first piece of taxidermy was because animal preservation has been around since the most popular um, example would be ancient Egypt, you know, the mummies. Um, there are also mummies coming out of South America as well. So um, preservation has been around as long as, like, I think probably as long as people have been around. But the oldest surviving piece of taxidermy that we know of is from about the mid 1500s. And it's a crocodile um, hanging, from a, hanging from a ceiling in a church in Italy. Um, the oldest piece of bird taxidermy, since we're all bird people here, um, is actually a pet bird from around the 1700s, it's a pet parrot that belonged to the Duchess of Richmond. Um, so those are some fun facts about old taxidermy. And so the 1800s were sort of when taxidermy got this explosion in techniques and advances in materials. Um, some of my favorite historic taxidermists from, from around this time are John Edmonstone, um, whose story is really, really remarkable because he actually, um, he was born into slavery in Guyana, but then once he was freed from it, he moved to Edinburgh, eventually taught Charles Darwin how to do taxidermy and how to preserve specimens. And after Darwin took these classes with Edmund Stone, that's when he went on to the Beagle and brought back all of those finches and, you know, the rest is, the rest is history. And I mean, if there's one thing you get out of tonight is go Google John Edmund Stone and his story. It's, it's a really incredible story. Um, another really cool historic taxidermist I like is Martha Maxwell, who was an American taxidermist um, from, you know, again, from around the 1800s, and she had a pretty eccentric personality. Um, she was one of the few women who was doing taxidermy at the time, and she was, she showed her work at the Philadelphia Centennial Expo, which at that time, no women were even allowed to speak in public. So she titled her, um, she had this huge room where she had, you know, all of Colorado's wildlife in there, um, just presented in, you know, in these like lush dioramas. She even had live prairie dogs running around just for, just for spectacle um, and just to really, really engage the public. And she, um, she entitled that exhibit Women's Work, um, which is sort of, you know, which is sort of a, for that time, it's a very, very bold move. Um, another really cool taxidermist is Carl Cotton, who, has and there's an exhibit about him at the Field Museum right now and there's a great article about his work right now and his work is just it's just spectacular so those three taxidermists I would say definitely check them out um, and now we'll go on a little tour of my of my studio and I'll show you some of the taxidermy process so let's see here I'm going to share my screen Right, 
so this is where um, I do all of my skinning and wet processing. So it's easy to disinfect. There's a fleshing wheel back there. Um, that's that little sort of um, half moon shaped thing. That is what I use to clean birds. But this is where I skin things. Um, and it's, you know, it's just where it's, there's nothing really special about what it is. It's just a surface easy to, that's easy to disinfect. Um, these are all my skinning and fleshing tools. So there are lots of scalpels, tweezers, scissors. Um, dental picks, knives, even little like miniature bone files, brain scoops, even just pieces of wire that are kind of turned into, that I've like hammered into, into tools. Um, really taxidermy tools are not always specific to taxidermy. They're sort of a little bit of everything. Um, this is a bird after it's been skinned and once it's been washed. So this is a piece that I worked on for a nature center. It's a ruby-throated hummingbird. So this is, um, this is what it looks like once there's, you know, once everything has been removed. The next slide will show a carcass, so just be mindful of, of seeing that. It's not too gory, but I'll go there anyway. Um, so this is the carcass, so this is what comes out of the hummingbird. It's its body um, and its neck. Um, I've got a penny there for scale, so you can see how, um, how small it is. And um, the leg and wing bones are left inside and cleaned up so that the form and support could be built around them. Then after I do that, I head over to my sculpting bench where I, you know, I carve and sculpt things here. I've got all my, all my carving and sculpting tools up there. It's, that bench has seen a lot of paint and clay and epoxy and stuff all over it, but it's got good stories. And this is the carcass next to a carved form. So this form, this grayish brownish thing is what goes inside of that skin you saw before. And that's what gives that bird its shape. Um, you can also make a form out of wood wool or a sisal or a dense foam. Um, but here I use balsa wood. And this is the clay in the eye setting. So this is a different bird because I didn't take a photo of, the, of this process in the hummingbird um, because I forgot to. So this is the clay in the eye setting. So there's an artificial eye and some clay being packed into the clean skull. Here we've got the clean and fluffed skin along with a form. Again, this is not that same bird, but it's a different bird. Um, but you can see the, you can see sort of the, the process coming together. And then once it's sewn up, that bird from the first photo is now mounted and you can kind of see, you can kind of see that video there. And I know the male in the nest is not correct, but that's what the Nature Center wanted. Um, and here's my freezer and how I store skinned birds. Um, they're, um, that's how I store them when they're gonna be mounted at a later date. Sometimes I have to skin stuff and then mount it, um, mount it later on. Um, it's stored in pantyhose, actually. It smooths and compresses the feathers so that, um, so it really keeps it nice and together. Um, and everything is labeled and I wrap it up in reused plastic to protect it from freezer burn. And then here are my tools and dry storage. So it looks a lot like anything from a, from a hardware store. Um, and yeah, and that is sort of my studio tour. So we'll get out of there. And now I'll share some photos of my work. So here I've got, let me just X out of this slideshow because it's really in my whole screen. So one of the things that I've been working on recently that I'm excited about is this, which is a, it's a 3D printed bat skeleton. Um, and this is sort of for more home decor clients because bats are, they tend to be imported um, in a very questionable manner. So I make replica bats out of them and some of the replica bats I make end up turning into something like this, which I hope you can kind of see. So they're, they're put into a dome, and this would be more of a home decor object, so it's not really a piece of, um, not really a piece of museum text or me like you saw before, where it's more of a, a decorative object. Um, some other work I've done has been sort of halfway between something decorative and something, um, something for the home, which is, like this bird here, this magpie jay. Um, it's on a branch with this tiny mouse who's sort of contemplating his, they're, they're both contemplating each other's fate, I guess. Um, and so this piece was, um, was a traditional taxidermy piece. And um, behind me, I think you can see these flamingos, which aren't really flamingos at all. They are made from waterfowl. So again, they're replica. Um, these are replicas. So I took some 
white waterfowl and dyed feathers in order to make them look like flamingos. And underneath there's a sculpted head, um, the legs are sculpted and all of that. And the last piece of my work I'll show you is sort of, um, again, kind of something in between this like fantasy and reality. This is, um, this would be what they would have in the sort of 1800s if without TV. So this is a bird automaton. Um, all of the pieces are reclaimed from an old, from an 1800s automaton. I clean them up and reassemble them. And the bird, you can see the shape of the body is kind of, it's kind of stiff looking, but that's because inside it contains a mechanism to tweet. And I think that's just pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so it turns around and tweets. So from that, you can kind of see that taxidermy has like a really wide, wide range of, of applications. Um, and why I love taxidermy is that the reason I think we should keep it around, there are a few reasons. The main one is curiosity. I mean, luckily we've advanced a lot from the 1800s in a lot of great ways. And taxidermy has really gone like in and out of taste and favor, but now there's a really big resurgence and in interest in anything that is not a digital, hobby, anything that's sort of where you can connect with something with your hands. Um, and the great thing about taxidermy is that you're getting really close to an animal and you're looking at it from the inside out. You're rebuilding it and that process, no matter how many times I do it, it just fills me with so much wonder and so much awe. And I think that awe and wonder are some of the greatest parts of nature to connect with. And it's just, you know, like when I was working on that hummingbird, I was like, oh my gosh, like no matter how many times I've seen these at you know, at feeders or, you know, spying them outside. Like, how does this, like, this little penny-sized nugget contains all the workings of life in there, and that just, like, it just makes you, I don't know, it makes your, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Um, another thing, like, in the museum setting, there's public engagement and accessibility of, to the animals. So, when you get close to a real animal that's preserved, you kind of see details especially if it's a good taxidermy, you see details that you wouldn't normally see safely when you're outside um, or when you're seeing them. It's also a way to get close to animals that don't exist where you live. So it's a way to see, you know, it's a way to kind of travel the world without, without, leaving, a, without leaving a building. Um, and, you know, a photo or video doesn't really fully capture the same thing. So you kind of get, again, that sense of wonder and that sense of awe. Um, and it sort of makes, um, for me at least, it makes th those words like wildlife trafficking or habitat loss take on a whole other meaning because you see this animal right there and you're, you're staring into that eye and even though, that's a, even though it's a glass eye, you're just sort of like, you're just sort of moved by it in a way that, um, in a way that a photo just doesn't make that, make that connection. Um, another value to it along the, same, along the same way with engagement is even if it's artistic taxidermy, even if it's something that's made as a home decor object, it's still animal art. So people are still thinking about animals. Um, taxidermy is usually a small business, so they're usually supporting a small business in that way, which is a which is sort of a good thing for you know for local artists. Um, I've had some really great conversations with people who are buying things for their home, where they might not have known something about an animal. They might not have known. Um, a lot of people I talk to don't know that they can even go bird watching in New York City. So they, you know, they'll buy a bird for me and then they'll say, I had no idea that, you know, like I, they're like, I wish I could see birds here. And I'm like, you can, <laughs> there are lots of great groups to go with. So um, it's a way to just get people thinking about animals. And I think that connection is just the first step in, in um, you know, igniting a passion in, in someone who might normally not feel like they have a place in in like conservation or they might not feel connected to it. Um, another aspect of taxidermy that makes it important is one that I wish didn't exist, which is extinction. Um, it would be way more preferable if animals didn't go extinct, but taxidermy is a way to preserve these animals for study, for proof, and for appreciation. And it's really haunting, but those, those animals really serve as artifacts as to um, how easily life can be gone, how easily this biodiversity can be lost. And so people can connect to it that way. I mean, there was a time I was working on a passenger pigeon and it was um, a restoration, but it was really, um, you know, it was, it was really, really like electric and surreal to kind of see this animal that, you know, it was like time travel, you know, I'm traveling across space and time by connecting to this animal. And I think that um, that connection that people get can be, you know, can help hopefully prevent future extinctions. And the last, 
the last sort of thing that I like about taxidermy is its cultural value. So there are all these mounts and dioramas and, you know, whether they're something in a museum, whether it's something as home decor, whether it's an antique, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, it carries the attitude of the person who made it because taxidermy is a thing that humans do to animals. So sometimes it carries good things, sometimes it carries bad things. It carries history, history can be really messed up. But what's exciting now is that taxidermy now has so many other possibilities. There are, you know, there are so many opportunities that I think haven't been unlocked yet. I don't even know what they all are. There are things just waiting to be discovered and waiting to be unlocked. And I think that this new generation of taxidermists are sort of going to come to terms with how we address all that history in a, in a very meaningful and hopefully a very intersectional way so that this art doesn't fade into irrelevance. Um, and I think that is one of the, you know, just not fading into irrelevance is one of the best things I think we could do for, that we could do for conservation. So that is um, what I have to say about text for me. And um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Hope it was enjoyable. Thank you so much, Divya. That was awesome. Um, I, we didn't plan on who was gonna do a little pass off, but um, Kaylee, you can come on next. You are muted though. <laughs> I'm muted. Hey guys, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Hey everyone. Um, I'm Kaylee. I work at the Field Museum in Chicago um, in the bird collections, uh, which is kind of just like a giant bird library. And my job kind of entails a lot of different things. I send a lot of researchers measurements of birds and tissues and DNA samples. Um, I also run a photo documentation project that um, I'll talk about later on. And um, I also have like a dream team of volunteers. I know a couple of you guys are watching and I miss all of you guys, but um, I train a lot of volunteers on specimen uh, preparation and how to preserve these specimens. Um, so. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk to you about museum specimens, where they come from, uh, what we do with them, and the types of things that we can learn from them. And so first off, I'm gonna talk about where museum specimens come from, um, specifically our Field Museum Salvage Collection. And Chicago is kind of a major stop for thousands of birds on their way to and from their breeding and wintering grounds every year. And with an abundance of tall lighted buildings, cities kind of provide numerous obstacles for birds to fly into. And um, I mean, just to put a number on it, the Field Museum takes in about 6,000 dead birds a year just from downtown Chicago. Um, so Chicago Bird Collision Monitors is an all-volunteer-based um, dedicated uh, project dedicated to the protection of migratory birds. And during spring and fall migration, volunteers have these daily routes um, downtown Chicago. They know what buildings are the big problematic buildings. Um, and basically they'll go look for these birds every day during migration and um, take injured ones to a local wildlife rehab center and all of the dead ones then get sent to the field museum. Um, and they're, they're part of this huge uh, salvage program. And I, I apologize, I thought I'd be able to get into the museum today to show you guys some specimens and show you around, but um, with everything going on, I'm not able to get access to the prep lab right now. So I have a little um, presentation I put together for you and I'm gonna try a screen share. I can't see where screen share is at on here. Here we go, okay. Sorry guys, bear with me. Um, all right, so can you guys see this? I go in presentation mode. I hit presentation on. Okay, cool. So this is the bird prep lab. Um, I know a lot of you guys have been in here before and if you were to walk in on any given day, you would see Dave Willard sitting at this green chair on the left hand side. There's another counter that kind of runs along the wall there. Um, and every day you see him personally measuring birds. He's measured every bird that's come in the prep lab for the last 40 years. Um, it's a really incredible data set. Um, but basically you would see him sitting there logging in and processing specimens and processing specimens um, basically entails taking a lot of measurements. Uh, we measure every bird that comes in, we take weight measurements, um, wing, tail, body, bill, tarsus. Um, we take things like the date and location found get recorded, the name of the collector, whoever found it and brought it to us. We take their name down and their um, name goes on our database as a collector for that bird. Um, any parasites found get collected. 
it, and it also gets assigned a number at this point. So I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but there's a little number column over here. And um, this is just sequential, but basically we, as birds come in, we assign them a, a number so we can identify them until they get completely cataloged. Um, you'll notice all of these birds on the right-hand side, these are specimens after they've been totally processed and they've gone through the catalog process, they've gone through the skinning process and they're in the collection and they're ready to be used. Um, all of them have these uh, long tags on them. And uh, the importance of labeling specimens really can't be too strongly emphasized. Uh, the, the data that comes with these specimens is kind of the most important part about them. And unlabeled specimens or data or specimens with no data aren't really of much use to scientists and um, specimens with very limited data are also of limited use. Um, so everything that comes in, we make sure to take really great data of where it comes from and, and who brought it in, what time of year it was here, et cetera. Um, so we also have a lot of different types of specimens. These are skeletons. We also have study skins, uh, pickled specimens, and um, we also collect uh, eggs, nests, pellets, uh, parasites, and stomach contents. Uh, this is actually moss that came out of a turkey, which I didn't even know that turkeys ate moss until I dissected one. Um, but they do, and we kept it. And we tried to make it a little terrarium for a little bit, and it, it didn't work out so well in the end. It didn't survive very well in the crop lab. There wasn't a lot of sun, but um, anyways. We can learn a lot from these specimens and so we're collecting them but what exactly are we doing with them why are we taking in all of these dead birds um, and they kind of give us invaluable information about the state of the environment and its biodiversity every specimen is a little bit unique um, it has its own dna its own characteristic traits its own specific measurements um, information about how it was collected and uh, specimens with really good data allow us to make comparisons and um, ask questions either within a species or a time frame or a geographic range. Uh, it's, it's really incredible. And the Field Museum has over 500,000 bird specimens in its collection right now. So every specimen that comes in, we take DNA samples. Um, and uh, analysis of these DNA samples or, or you know, a genetic sequence, sequence allows scientists to track these evolutionary lineages. lineages. Um, and kind of make these connections between organisms, specifically with birds in this case that we're talking about today. But um, DNA sequencing is kind of central to our understanding of molecular evolution. And we found a lot of genomic relationships between songs and birds, between um, evolution of morphological features, evolution of different types of feathers, um, the respiratory system. It's, it's really incredible the types of things that we can learn from DNA. Um, so this is a genomic or a phylogenetic tree, um, but the abundance of genomic data available nowadays has kind of enabled researchers to really uh, clarify the early evolution and divergence of bird groups. So we've pr produced a much more detailed phylogenetic tree than we've ever had in the past, and scientists are um, sharing a lot of this information and producing more and more information. Um, so it's really great. There's a lot of papers that come out about this stuff. So um, we also can look at feather isotopes. Um, oh, before I get to that, this is our DNA storage in the basement. Um, so these big dewar tanks all the way to the left is, um, it's called a dewar, but that tank holds about 72,000 tissue vials on a rotating like Lazy Susan system. And um, that's John Phelps. He's a, a collections assistant for the mammals division, but we all share these. We have about eight of these tanks in our basement. Um, and he's switching over the liquid nitrogen. So these are, these are all stored in liquid nitrogen. They're very, very cold. We have to wear, um, real tall gloves when we go in to get a sample. So um, this is our basement storage though. Um, so feather isotopes. Um, so you'll see uh, this feather with a bunch of molecules next to it and then you'll see this big map of the United States. And basically um, the global patterns uh, on this map reflect the precipitation and evaporation of the oceans and um, they take in the distance to the coast, the elevation and temperature and all of that information. And Scientists can then compare the isotopic content of a feather sample um, from a bird and uh, basically when that feather was grown that um, the hydrogen and nitrogen and um, carbon molecules in that feather would reflect a bird's diet from where in the world that that feather was grown when that bird was eating whatever it was eating when it was growing these feathers. Um, so we can take feather snips or, or samples from birds. We can um, do some non-destructive 
it's non-destructive in the sense you can pull a couple feathers from a specimen that is 100 years old and analyze it in a lab and it's not going to destroy the specimen but we can get some really incredible information from it just by taking a couple feathers so um feather topes, feather isotopes uh, are also something that uh, a lot of researchers are doing this work was kind of pioneered in like the late 90s i think like 97 or 98 the first paper came out but it has seen a lot of papers come out since you see those so um parasites will also collect parasites from from birds um they're pretty gross these are some mites lining up on the feather barbules on the left and um these are some some louse collected from an owl on the right um, parasites have uh, different effects and play major roles on the hosts that they exploit and um, some even even alter their host phenotype which is observable characteristics how the how the bird looks um, birds or parasites can have an effect on that um, and we there's not a lot of literature about parasites right now not a lot of people are studying them um, so the more we look at them the more we can um, better understand relationships and their importance in bird populations. And if anyone is interested in parasites, um, Jason Lexine at Drexel University is a great person to talk to. He's doing a lot of really cool research with parasites. So check out his lab if you're interested. Um, we'll also talk about morphometrics. This is Dave. Uh, if you've been in the Field Museum at all to do with birds, um, I'm sure you would have met Dave. He's there every day. Um, he is curator emeritus of the, the bird collection. And so this is um, him standing in front of the collection. Um, and the collection is, is kind of this, like a library of birds. It's cabinets full and full of birds. Um, but basically we can uh, use these collections to analyze certain traits and track how they're changing throughout time, especially because the salvage program has been going on for about 40 years. Um, we have 40 years worth of data of birds that have been coming through Chicago during their spring and fall migrations. And so um, Dave and some of the, the colleagues at the Field Museum have um, come up with this really great research paper. This is the title for it. I highly suggest you all read it. Um, it basically talks about uh, increasing temperatures associated with climate change and how birds over the past 40 years are getting smaller in response to uh, these changes. And um, the, the birds' bodies are getting smaller, but their wings are getting a little larger to compensate for flight. It's, it's really wild. Um, I'll be sure to post a link to it so you guys can read it, but it's really incredible and it's all about uh, field museum specimens. So. Um, and then recently, we've also started this uh, documenting project called Plume, and Plume is um, phenotype linkage utilizing multimedia in EMU. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, phenotype is the observable, observable characteristics of birds, so what they physically look like, um, how their feathers lay on their body, what, do, what does that look like, and how can we compare these across uh, many individuals of the same species. And so the Field Museum started this uh, documentation project in April of 2019. So these letter, these numbers are a little um, outdated. This was for a conference I went to in um, October, November. If anyone was at the Wilson conference, we presented on this. Um, it's a really incredible resources resource. There's no other institutions that, are, um, that we've been able to, to talk to uh, documenting birds like this. And um, all of these images are uploaded to a database every day. Um, the database goes live, goes live every Friday. So these images are all published online and they're a free resource for whoever wants to use them. And it's pretty much every salvaged bird that we can find downtown before it gets uh, processed as a skeleton where we lose all of these feathers because we're just saving the skeleton. Now we have um, records of the bird's feathers, which is really incredible. So. There are a couple um, close-up photos. These are all really high-quality photos. Um, they're all uh, local Chicago migratory birds. I guess not local, but migratory. So um, with that, I'm going to stop. But um, I want to say thank you to all my volunteers. Uh, these are all girls and um, that have been in the prep lab, either uh, seeing birds or helping with skeletons or helping number bones. And um, the work we do couldn't be done without them. And I miss all you guys, so I hope to see you all soon. But um, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, guys. Let's stop sharing. Cool. Yay, thank you, Kaylee. Oh my gosh, I'm like getting text messages about how cool right. everything you were showing was. <laughs> I just got a notification that my internet is unstable as I 
signed out of that, so I hope you guys could hear all of that. It, it, like, it was totally fine. I think everybody could hear it for the most part. It was, like, a little robotic at points, but it was perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I know, I just wanted to say, a lot of people are asking questions about links, and, like, we, we are planning to send out a compilation of links and resources after this to everybody who signed up with their email to the Eventbrite. So um, it might not be immediate, but we will send that out. Um, and next up is Aurora. Okay. Um, hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Aurora. I work for New York City Audubon on the conservation team as a conservation associate. And so today I'm going to be actually talking to you guys a little bit about Project Safe Flight. I'm going to be talking to you guys about collisions and what New York City Audubon kind of does on our end and what you can kind of do on your end. Um, so I'll share my screen. Um, let's see. So, so Project Safe Flight. So we are in the business at New York City Audubon of making the city safer for birds. And I think I'm in good company here that most of you guys want the same thing. We want cities to be safe for birds. And the way, one of the ways we do that is with Project Safe Flight. So Project Safe Flight, I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about birds and bird migration, threats to, as Kaylee said, some of the threats to migrating birds like light and class, and our Project Safe Flight program, what we do and what you can do as in this, um, this New York City Audubon initiative. Um, let's see. So migration. Kaylee kind of talked to you guys a little bit about migration, and I'm just going to kind of elaborate just a tiny bit more that, like, you know, many species of birds migrate between their northern feeding grounds and their wintering grounds. Um, and why do birds migrate? They migrate for a lot of reasons, for food, for nesting space, for mating purposes. Um, so they, and sometimes, you know, they just want to migrate. Um, when birds attempt to migrate through urban areas like Chicago or New York City, they are faced with a variety of threats when these little guys try to fly large distances and we kind of stop them with our buildings, essentially. Um, so small songbirds migrate at night and we have the black pole warbler, which averages about eight, oh, 1,864 miles, close to 2,000 miles for like this little guy to travel, only for his, his wonderful and amazing journey to be cut short by a building. That's sad. Um, any death is a death and we don't want any more of these wonderful species to, for their populations to dwindle or even go extinct. So that's why we put our time and energy into conserving this and working hard via um, Project Safe Light. Um, and so, like I said, New York City is a stopover habitat like Chicago. So many types of birds, shorebirds, songbirds, nesting birds, they all use New York City as a, a stopping point for, before they move on. And so, I'm gonna give you kind of like a bird's eye view, pun fully intended, of like, you know, the things they go through and why, what we're doing to mitigate those. So threats to migrating birds. Um, we have two major threats to migrating birds. One of them is dazzling light, which is a night problem. And then one of them is the day problem, which I will be talking about today, which is deceptive glass. Um, like I said, today I'll be focusing on deceptive glass as the night problem, dazzling light is something we also deal with. Um, for our night migrating friends. So this is not a pleasant picture. I'm sorry that it's not very pleasant, but it's to illustrate the point and emphasize the point that in the United States alone, it's estimated that an average of 100 million to 1 billion birds are killed every day due to window collisions. That's extremely depressing. Like, um, we don't want that to happen. Um, and this can be fixed. It can be fixed really, really easily. And so I'm sure some of you guys have read the article a few months ago about there being like a 30% decline in bird populations. And I'm sure none of us want any more species to go extinct or be threatened or endangered any more than they are. So this is bad and we want to fix this. And everyone here, I imagine also wants to fix this. Um, and here is the Circa building in NYC. This is kind of recent. Um, Circa building's been identified as being a massive killer of migrating birds, um, which is kind of, which is, it's a evocative photo simply because of the death that it, that it represents. And every death is a death and we don't want to see this. Um, so our day problem. Our day problem right now is glass. And collisions are a huge problem because like, this is a typical example of what you see when you see collisions. Um, it just, it really messes the bird up. Like even if they 
manage to survive the situation. They can lose their consciousness, broken wings or legs so that they never fly ever again, bleeding, blunt force trauma, um, danger from exposure to predators for like feral cats or even coyotes or various other animals. So this is what a collision can do to a bird. It effectively ends their life for the most part. Some birds, a small amount, end up stunned and relatively fine, but an even larger amount just die or they're permanently maimed and disabled forever. Um, bird's eyes don't really see the way that we do, right? They have lower contrast, um, they have a blind spot, and we really can't see glass either. We only really see glass because of visual cues like handles or like special coating that we use for human eyes, and we don't really extend that same courtesy to our feathered friends, but we can do that. And oftentimes birds will see vegetation through the glass and think that there is not a threat there and try to do that, and that's our bad, that's our fault. Um, I know lots of people oftentimes try to tell me even like, oh, well, birds are just dumb. That's why this happened. Birds are not stupid. They are incredibly complex creatures. They have complex bodies and incredibly complex behaviors and mating patterns. I just showed you guys the map where you can see kind of the different places that they specifically migrate to. They're not dumb for like bumping into the glass. We can actually barely see the glass and we haven't made it adaptable to any other species except for human eyes. So continuing on to the day problem of glass, as I said, humans actually can't even see glass that well. Um, this was from an apple building that developed an extremely glass system and people were hitting themselves left and right and they eventually had to change it. So, um, and proving on to my point, I just kind of just think this GIF is funny. Like this is kind of another example of like what you kind of see. We can't really see it. We look for cues. And if those cues weren't there, we would also be confused and be bumping into windows and glass at a much higher rate. So like I said, we designed it for human eyes. We didn't really consider the birds, but we can do that and we can fix that. So Project Safe Flight is one of the ways we're trying to fix it. And we're trying to fix it through mitigation, through policy, through education and outreach, and through research. And so here is one of the super colliders, which is the incredibly adorable white-throated sparrow. Um, so in Project Safe Flight, basically we collect data, we put mitigation in place, we campaign for change, which is policy change really. Um, and we collaborate with a lot of different organizations in order to make this happen and make it happen on a larger scale beyond New York City. So mitigation. So basically when I say mitigation, I mean retrofitting solutions. So there's ways, like I said many times previously, there's ways that we can fix it so that birds can also see these markers and not, not die. Um, many of the ways we do that is sand blasting or etching glass, window netting, ceramic fits, or something as simple as bird tape that you can do at your own house. Um, and those are the different examples of patterns that you can use to make your building or your house bird safe. And then like, see, it's, it's incredibly, it's a doable thing. And so that one of the things that we do also is testing to see um, if any are more bird friendly than others. Um, here are two of our scientists, uh, our staff scientists, kind of testing different types of retrofitting solutions and seeing which ones are better for birds, are more visible for birds. And I promise you no birds were harmed in this testing. They are all fine, um, but some are a little bit better than others, but anything is better than the current state that we, that we really have. Um, and here's a case study. Um, this was a building that was controlled from 2001 to 2004. Almost a thousand birds were found. Um, and here's a bird's eye view again of the building. Um, some, of the, some of the casualties. And eventually they agreed to retrofit windows and it worked significantly in that building. Is, there was a gigantic decrease in the amount of collisions and we consider this a huge success and really just an example of how you can lessen collisions pretty easily. Um, and another thing that we do also is policy and education. We have the Bird Safe Glass Working Group where you know, specialists and architects from various fields work on creating solutions. We do courses. We also have one of the policy that was passed. I am going to let Molly Adams talk for a little bit about the recent policy that was changed. Thanks, Aurora. And also thank you, Danielle, for the shout out in the chat. Um, and Elaine, I'm so glad you also love ceramic frit. I like, after I made that comment, I was like, mm, that's weird, but I do. But anyway, um, I, I am also the advocacy and outreach manager for New York City Audubon. I started last year in February and um, 
in March, they, this bill, INT 1482, was introduced in the city council. Um, and so that proposed a change to the New York City building code that would require all new buildings to use all bird safe glass. Um, uh, so along with my colleagues at New York City Audubon, we put together a working group of architects, uh, conservationists, policy folks, um, and of course, bird safe buildings experts uh, and worked with city council to amend the bill to make it easier to enforce uh, and more practical, changing it so that the bird friendly materials only needed to go up to uh, the first 75 feet on the building. Like, like Aurora said, um, these birds are usually seeing the reflections. So it's not necessarily that they're hitting the really high tall uh, skyscrapers all the way up, um, but closer down to the bottom where it is reflecting vegetation. Um, so we worked with our partners on a media campaign, including emailing, tweeting, and sending postcards. And uh, we got so much support for this bill. Um, sometimes people were sending out tweets of dead birds to their council members, and there was just a lot of public support for it. And uh, ultimately it passed in December with um, a, a 43 to three vote. Uh, so it, it, it passed with overwhelming support and uh, it is aimed to go into effect of January 21, uh, 2021. So uh, hopefully no, uh, hopefully every new building from here on out in starting January will be bird friendly. Um, but yeah, thanks. And I can't really stress this enough. This, this was a this was huge. So this was like a huge thing that happened, and a really great step in the right direction. And Molly worked really hard on it, and we're really really excited to kind of see some of this action after we've spent so long researching this to be put into place. Um, which leads me, I'm going to be talking for another five minutes or so to talk about the other things that we do, which is research. So here is some of our research that we got from collision monitoring and analyzing that data. And since 1997. Hundreds, like hundreds of volunteers and thousands of patrols and over 7,000 birds found. And here are the top 20 species that New York City Audubon has identified as being most likely to collide. As you can see, there are a lot of songbirds. There's the th there's sparrows and yellow throats and various types of warbler, the American woodcock, which is one of my personal favorites, and, um, and the American robin. So a lot of these birds are hitting at a really rapid rate and like we don't want that to happen. Um, so this research helps kind of not only identify buildings that are problems, but also identify specific species that are more prone to collisions and how we can study them further and make sure that the city is safe for them. Um, here are some of the, where does that data go? So that data goes to various ornitho ornithological papers, it goes to um, buildings, it goes into writing policy. Um, so we use our own data to produce and write these papers. Um, in order to you know get the policy changed ultimately and like study sp various species and study their the effects of the collisions so which leads me to talking about collision monitors um, our collision monitors are a huge part of project safe flight and it's they're the, they're pretty much solely the reason that this can happen or this research can take place or even the policy can be passed so what do collision monitors do they patrol once a, one day a week during spring and fall migrations um, between 7 and 10 a.m. They collect data on bird collisions along the route and then they transfer the injured birds to rehab and we collect the dead birds for ID and donation. Um, we have a bird fridge at our main office where we have the freezer full of dead birds and specimens to identify, study, collect, and oftentimes those specimens go to various institutions. Um, sometimes they go overseas. I know a lot of them go to the American Museum of Natural History, for example, for um, donation. And here is a sample data sheet that our uh, collision monitor volunteers take with them. Um, as you can see, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty com complex. You have to have some ID bird knowledge, um, but we also help the volunteers ID birds if they necessarily can't. They have to provide pictures. Um, and we, all of this is useful data that gets analyzed. Um, so here's kind of what it looks like at our at our office or around town when we look at the various types of birds that fall down or, or collide. And our 2019 results kind of showed 215 birds found, 43 species, um, 177 dead, 38 injured, and that might not seem high for New York, but remember we want the number to be zero. We don't want any bird deaths. Um, so our goal is to kind of just keep 
identifying these problem buildings, keep studying these species until the number dwindles to zero. And that would be huge for a, a place like New York City that has 8 million people and thousands upon thousands of buildings. So our ideal utopian hope is that we can get this down to zero just through persistence, education, and our research. Oh, and what you guys can do. Um, so this is D-Bird. D-Bird is NYC Audubon's bird mortality database. You do not have to live in New York City to do D-Bird. The link is right there. So what you can do, even if you're not a collision monitor or you're not interested in the commitment of being a collision monitor, you can always do a route around your neighborhood. You can walk around your neighborhood or even if you just happen to come across a dead bird, you can enter this and you can actually help us kind of find the problem spots and like further aid our ACE research or where the Project Safe Flight volunteers go to patrol routes. So as you can see, you just mentioned the date and time you found it, observe the species, um, whether it's dead or not, the sex, the age, your name, and some contact info. Um, so I would definitely urge some of you guys, if you're interested in bird conservation or helping out, if you're helping out in this situation with bird mortality is to you know, go on D-Bird and kind of check it out and enter if you have the time. So this is kind of what your data would go to if you were entering D-Bird or what Project Safe Flight data also goes to we can see where the birds are reported, where they're dead, where they're injured, and we can zoom in even further usually to find out what specific buildings are causing the most collisions, like Circa, for example. Other ways you can help. So you can actually be a trans, I, wherever you are, you can usually have options to be a transporter for injured birds. If you see an injured bird, take them to a local wildlife rehabilitator. Um, at the Wild Bird Fund is New York City's wildlife rehabilitator, but there's, some, there's many all over the country and all over globally. Um, you can enter non-patrolled birds into D-Bird. Like I said, the link was previously put, and I will try to put the link in the chat. You can be an advocacy volunteer. You can contact Molly Adams for that, or you can contact me. I am always looking for Project Safe Flight volunteers or outreach volunteers. So if you guys are interested in helping out that way, we always appreciate the efforts. Um, and that's my presentation. So thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you guys for coming to this webinar. And I will try to answer some questions when I can, but thank you guys so much. And I will stop sharing. Awesome job, Aurora. Um, awesome job, everybody. Um, I'm, everybody's back on now. Can, can, um, Everyone who is an attendee see all of the panelists now? Okay, cool. So we are going to start the moderated Q&A part. Um, so I'm going to look at some of the questions from the Q&A and then Francis is going to look at some from the chat because there are some there too. Um, but I'm going to start and pick one for Divya. Um, do the specimens need to be preserved with any kind of chemical? This is from an anonymous person. So yeah, so specimens are preserved with, um, with chemicals. For birds in particular, um, small birds, um, they're preserved with either a, like sort of, um, so what they used to use was like an arsenic soap or an arsenic paste. So now we use different chemicals. So it's not arsenic, but it's still a paste. So that's what I use. It's got, it's sort of a, a mix of different, it's a mix of different chemicals in there. It's like camp, it's like a camphorous paste. Um, something else people use is borax. Um, but what a lot of taxidermy is done with, with mammals, the, the skin is tanned like leather. So it turns from a rawhide into leather. But for birds, it's usually a preservative powder or a preservative paste. For mammals, it's usually tanned, like leather. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Um, I have been tracking um, questions in the chat. So this one is for Kaylee. It's from Nicole. Um, said, study skins drying on their backs. Does that flatten their backs? And why does that matter? Why does it not? Yeah, it totally flattens their backs. Um, they're like these little torpedoes and their, their wings are kind of um, stuck behind them. Um, that shape is a worldwide standard and it's for two reasons really. Um, it allows for access to all of the measurements that we would still need to take on a study skin. So although we're taking measurements as we log these birds in, researchers always want to take their own measurements. It's just something you always want to take your own measurements, make sure they're 
to your standard. Um, and so that position allows for all of the extremities to still be measured. You can put a wing ruler in and still access the wings. You can access the tarsus. You can measure the bill. Um, and the other reason is for storage. Um, taxidermy is really hard to store. Uh, it takes up a lot of space. Divya, you're shaking your head. I'm, I'm, you know, it takes up a lot of space. Uh, specimens, you can you can kind of lay them all in a drawer and and stack a bunch of drawers on top of each other and and um, Storage-wise, you can you can fit everything. There are some drawbacks. It does flatten the back. Um, when I skin birds and when all my volunteers skin birds, we make sure uh, the last thing we do when we pin a bird, there was a slide on my slideshow of a bunch of birds pinned to styrofoam. And those are just birds that are drying after they've been skinned. We let them dry for about a week. And the last thing I make all my volunteers do is slide a pin under the back of the head and it'll kind of flatten all the bed head out from the bird so it doesn't have like a flat like bald spot on the back. Um, but also uh, when we skin these birds, we're, we're laying them in positions where we know that they're gonna dry like that. So we wanna make sure all the feathers are, are laid out right and in the, the correct position. So we do try to smooth everything, but it does get flat. There's not much you can do, but the, it's also, I mean, it's a resource and there's people that are, um, you know, picking these up to use them all the time. So if, if the back's a little flat, it's, it's okay. We'd rather have the bird in the data than not have a bird at all. So we have flat backs. <laughs> Awesome, thank you, Kaylee. Yeah. I have a question for everybody in the Q&A that I need to find because everyone's asking such good questions. Um, can each of you talk about the steps? This is from Anna Christensen. Can each of you talk about the steps you took to get into your field and necessary qualifications? Um, I know you mentioned that Kaylee was going on to do a master's. Um, so why don't we start with Aurora? Hi, I've always had an interest in environmental science and environmentalism related causes. So it was kind of like a natural um, extension. I studied um, environmental science in undergrad and I've gone on to continue my studies studying environmental science. Um, and I, um, I just, I was also very involved with conservation. I was involved with the Student Conservation Association and I made sure to volunteer around campus um, working for environmental causes, um, specifically involving animals a lot of the time. So working for New York City Audubon just came as a natural extension of that. And my other work with um, the National Park Service doing research for coastal shorelines and stuff like that. So I was already kind of in that world and I just increasingly got more and more involved. But I think the easiest thing is to just get involved with a local organization um, that has your area of interest and a local conservation um, place and just kind of volunteer and do outreach. That's pretty much how I slowly got more and more involved and immersed in it and eventually how it became a, a path for research and a career for me. That's, that's all. Divya, you want to go or you want me to talk? Um, I'll go, I guess. So unlike, um, you know, unlike a lot of other fields, like there's no real like degree in taxidermy. So I actually went to school for just art and um, design. I worked as a fashion designer before this. Um, and I got into taxidermy through, it was a hobby of mine. It was a hobby that turned into a career over a really long time. Um, so yeah, I learned through like books and, you know, books and videos and stuff like that it was sort of self-taught. And once I gained a little confidence, um, I sought out people in the field to learn from going to, um, you know, taxidermy association shows and things like that. Um, and just sort of learned through experience and the, it was just like slowly transitioning from one job into another. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anyone personally about it because there are a lot of different options. So, yeah. Same, I uh, kind of got into this whole world on accident. Um, not on accident, but uh, I studied printmaking in college. I went to art school and um, I needed a science credit to graduate. And so I took a bird biology class thinking that it would kind of be this like blow off easy class. Like, yeah, who wants to go bird watching? That's fine. And I fell so hard in love with it um, to the point where it was my last semester of college. And I, at that point, just wrote the museum 
for division curator directly and asked if there was any way I could intern for him. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was really interested. And I just kind of was like enthralled with this world that I just discovered. And um, my internship ended and I graduated and I decided to stay on and um, kind of bounced around between departments. I was a research assistant for a mammologist for like three years working on a Philippine project. Um, and so I got a really cool like back end view of research and what it's like to like publish a paper or a textbook and and do field work and and what that entails and um i just kind of realized it wasn't something that i i ever wanted to step away from and so i decided to go back to school for it and um yeah just kind of i've been working with it Thanks everyone for answering. Um, I have another question for Aurora, but I'm sure anybody could also answer it. Um, Greta is wondering if anyone has any recommendations for the best anti-bird collision window stickers to purchase. Um, Molly said feathered friendly, but if anybody has any others. Hi, I would probably second feathered friendly, but I think that like Molly could more probably tell you the better ones to specifically purchase because um, I don't really focus on the specific types that people can buy. Um. Uh, so I, I, I just like Feathered Friendly because I've used it and I've seen it be successful but it really depends on your situation. Um, I sent a, okay I also see people are talking about my cat in the chat. Uh, she, her name is Rocky and she's great but um, the <laughs> The link that I sent out in the in the chat is to the American Bird Conservancy's website that has a really comprehensive list of all the different solutions. Um, so that it uh, like there's commercial solutions, there are home solutions, there are things you can do yourself, there are things you can buy, and so that website is really good. But then also, if you want to talk to me more about it and um, just have more opinions, if you want to email me, I'll put my New York City Audubon email address in the chat right now. But the big decals of the hawks don't work. Like you need to um, have a two by four pattern with whatever you do um, to make it so that the birds don't think that they can fly through whatever space you have. So the big, um, the big like hawk silhouettes are meant to, or were originally thought to scare away birds but they don't work and they will just try to fly around them you can also use soap um we just soap our windows and i mean definitely decals are like incredible but if you're in a pinch and like a bird just hit your window and you're worried it's migration another one might come through just rub a wet bar of soap across your window and it'll look great uh but birds won't hit it so <laughs> Okay, so now it's my turn to pick another question from the Q&A. Um, this is something that I want to know more about. Um, Kaylee, with the isotope analysis, does the type of feather make a difference, like a younger feather versus an older feather, or need to be, like, or need to be plucked from a specific area of the body? Oh, you're muted. Cool. Hey, okay. uh, it depends on the bird's molt. Um, and so when you pick a feather, um, birds molt at different, molting is growing of new feathers. So some birds will go through a complete body molt where they'll shed all their feathers at once. Um, ducks do this with their wings. They will molt all of their wing feathers at once. And you'll notice the females are sometimes flightless um, when they're sitting on a nest and that's because they're molting. Um, but basically when, when a bird is molting a feather, the isotopic content of that feather is gonna reflect that exact feather when it was grown. So if that feather, if you pull that feather and it's got more hydrogen or, or carbon or nitrogen or whatever compared to a feather on um, another part of that same individual, those feathers were probably grown at different times of the year, at, at different breeding plumages or, or wintering plumages. Um, so it really just depends on on um, the feather itself. You can, you can still read the isotopic content, whether it's a wing feather or a tail feather or a breast feather or 
um, a flight feather, a downy feather, whatever. It's just, it, it's really, um, you're, you're looking to see where that feather was grown at, so. Awesome, thanks Kaylee. Um, we have one, another question for Aurora. Is there any insight into why white-throated sparrows are such frequent victims of window strikes as compared to other species from Sean Zimmer? Hi, um, so I looked into this myself. Um, there doesn't seem to actually be a lot of extensive research onto why white-throated sparrows are the most collided with species. A simple oversight estimation would be simply because of their size. There's also, it's also the an abundance issue. They are very, very, there's a large abundance of white-throated sparrows, even though globally their populations are, are on the decline. Um, and I, so I would guess it's because of the size and the abundance of white-throated sparrows, but there's, an act, there's really not a lot of research about it. And then Kaylee, do you have any insight about the white-throated sparrows? Like, are, are they, do you find that they're a top collider in Chicago also? Yeah, I just wrote that's actually one of our biggest colliders as well. And I don't, I mean, I don't know species-wise why, mm. why them so much, but um, it's interesting that two totally separate regions have the same uh, top collider. We also get a lot of like, this year especially, I started volunteering with the bird collision monitors now that the museum's closed. And so I've, been going out and rescuing these birds and um, oven birds. We got so many oven birds this year. Like so one day we had like twenty something oven birds. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't know why such high numbers, especially for white throated sparrows, but they've consistently for a couple of years have been one of the top colliders. So I don't know. Bummer. I love white throated yeah. sparrows. <laughs> cute. We call them butter balls because they're always really fatty. Oh. Um, I had a question here that was kind of for everybody. Um, it's like a general taxidermy question. Uh, can you please discuss the legal issues involved in taxidermy birds in the U.S., given that most are protected by the Migratory Bird Act? So, so I can speak for, you know, working as a taxidermist, as, you know, working as a taxidermist like I do, doing a variety of work. So most of the birds I get are domestic birds. I would say, unless it's an English sparrow, European starling, or pigeon, it's a domestic bird. So those three non-protected birds are the only ones you can pick up. So the other birds, if you find them, head to D-Bird with Aurora, or head to, you know, and then ask someone like Kaylee if or, or at a museum if they can use it. Um, but it doesn't matter, um, the Migratory Bird Act was in the, um, was in the chat, so you can't touch anything that's on that. So everything I get is domestic. Um, there are some species that can't cross state lines, like certain birds that are on Lake Cites, they can't cross state lines. So um, that goes around all of the laws. Um, and as far as like the ethics are concerned, I mean, like the birds I get that are domestic are, you know, raised in zoos or aviaries or or as sometimes there are people's, um, people have pets. So when they're deceased, they'll freeze them and bring them to me. So that's, it's really important to do. Um, it's very, very important to follow the law with taxidermy. I also saw someone commented shortly after that asking about like legalities if they like pick up a bird with the intention to drop it off at a natural history museum or a university or an institution of some sort and that's totally okay. Um, a lot of times we get people that don't want to pick up birds because they're scared they're going to get in trouble and um, I'm not saying to keep them, you should not do that at all, um, but if you pick up a bird with the intention to bring it to um, an institution or natural resource or natural history museum, whatever, um, there is kind of a loophole in that clause that like, it's okay for you to be trans, like you can pick up that bird and record that data and put it in your freezer. And then the next day email a natural history museum or university and be like, hey, I have this bird, how do I get it to you? Um, that is totally fine. You're not gonna get in trouble for that. Um, if you're keeping the bird and like trying to create like a black market trade for it, yeah, you're gonna get in a lot of trouble for that. And it's stupid and you shouldn't be doing that. But if you're just picking it up to get it to a scientist or to, an educator or a student or someone, that's totally fine. And you should pick it up because that's how we get our specimens. 
and you get your name on a museum specimen, which like, how cool is that? So, so pick up the bird. Cool, I'm gonna mute. <laughs> Awesome. Um, I have a question from the chat from Bridget and Greta. It says, how many waterfowl did it take to replicate the flamingo for, uh, for Divya? Oh, it was quite a few. So um, I used, they, again, they were domestic. It was domestic geese and ducks that I used. Um, so it was, I think, two, I think it was like two and a half of each. Because they were, you know, I, I sort of like took the feathers out individually and put them back on to like a fake skin in a way. So, yeah, so five, five total for two, two flamingos, so five total, two and a half each. That is really amazing. Yeah, like that was also one of my questions that I was like, going to ask you after this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so cool. Hey. Um, so this question is from Jane from Belize. Uh, at the end of April 2017, I was on one of the offshore islands working with sea turtles and there was stormy weather overnight and there was a fallout of birds, mainly warblers. Would this have been an occasion for data entry in D-Bird? Aurora. I... Is it possible you could just repeat that last part a little bit? I'm muted, but I can also answer this question. But at the end of April 2017, I was on the offshore islands in Belize working with sea turtles. There, were storm there was stormy weather overnight and there was a fallout of birds, mainly warblers. Would this have been an occasion for data entry for D-Bird? I would recommend anytime people see uh, see dead birds to enter it into D bird. Usually what we collect is like off one off um, collections or one off specimens that have been found in the street and stuff like that. But if you see a large abundance of, of birds, I would certainly enter it into D bird. I would recommend it. I don't know. What do you think, Molly? Yeah, I would say yes. Um, I have entered dead birds from different parts of the country into D-Bird. Uh, I know that the map that Aurora showed was mostly just New York City, and that's where most of our volunteers are doing Project Safe Flight routes, but we can collect data from all over the world. Um, and so that's, that, especially if there's a big fallout, like Jane, I'm, I'm interested to hear more about what, like, what the circumstances were, um, but uh, I can message you later on. But thank you for asking that question and answering Aurora. All right, I have um, a question for you all as well. Um, Riley Kane, my dad, is wondering who are some of the top taxidermists in the US, past and present, or um, who are some of the taxidermists that you admire the most? And I know Divya, you said that a little bit, but it's open for all. I mean, you talked about both Carl Cotton, Carl Cotton, uh, and um, Akeley, and those are two field museum prominent taxidermists, and two that have really shaped the world for taxidermy from an early on stage, and kind of have kind of like broke these rules from the get go. Um, so those are two of my personal favorite. Um, I'm also not a taxidermist, and I, I love taxidermy. I've tried it; it's hard. I appreciate it, but I don't know that much. So maybe Divya take the wheel on that one. Sure. I mean, like, historically, yeah, Carl Akeley is a big, a really big one. And, you know, from the field to AM and H up here, um, you know, his work was extremely influential. I would definitely mention, again, Carl Cotton, um, Martha Maxwell, and John Edmundstone from, you know, some all periods of time. Um, some other interesting taxidermists from the past are um, Catherine Toss and Ada Rohu, they're a mother-daughter team that sort of did, they sort of did everything from like fantasy to museum work and they, um, they actually were very vocal about equal pay. So that's like, that part of history is really interesting to me when, um, you know, those bits that we don't really, that we don't really get. Um, as far as currently, there are, there are a lot of taxidermists. I think one I, one I admire the most, I think I'm actually really lucky to work with um, a few times a week is George Dante who um, 
I mean, he does so many remarkable things, but the coolest thing I think he's ever done, two coolest things I think he's ever done is make a fake um, or a replica tusk to track the ivory, the illegal ivory trade, um, which is just like, you've got to be really good to make something to fool, uh, to fool like the black market. Um, and then he also mounted um, Lonesome George, who was the last um, Pinta Island tourist. So... I mean, I could go on all day about it, but I'll, I can also uh, put my, I can also make a list for for the for taxidermists to to look at past and present. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, and we'll again send out as many links and resources related to this presentation as possible after um, it's all done. Yeah, and so I said that this was going to go until 8.15, so we're running a little over, but I do want to ask one more question, which is like a combination question, depending on who it's for, but it, what is your favorite bird that you either have in the collections of the Field Museum that you've worked on and done taxidermy with, or that Aurora just in general, either it can be a Project Safe Flight victim or just a bird in general, it's up to you. And I'm gonna start with Kaylee. Oh, shovel-billed kingfisher. Uh, they're just weird, it's a it's a kingfisher. Look up, I will type it right here. It's, um, sh my keyboard is not working. Shovel-billed kingfisher. Um, they are so weird, they're kingfisher, but they have like a toenail for a beak and they dig worms. Um, they're just a weird kingfisher. I don't know. I don't, I, I really like them. Um, I took one out to draw once and just kind of like, it became my favorite bird as I sat with it. Uh, they're really incredible. Um, I haven't ever worked on one. They're, they're not from America at all. Um, but, uh, yeah, I like them a lot. So that would be maybe my favorite bird. Also chickens. I love chickens. <laughs> they're weird. <laughs> Aurora, do you want to go next? Yeah, it's hard for me to pick a favorite. I like, I'm always really fascinated when like the birds of prey come in, like um, red-tailed hawks or like falcons and stuff like that. I'm just like, whoa. And I like have a little nerdy freak out every single time. But um, some of the ones that I think are especially interesting or especially cute are the black and white warbler. I just think they're neat and really adorable and like you want to boop their nose. And I also like the woodcock because I think their dance is super funny. I don't like seeing them dead, but I like seeing them because I just think that they are really cool creatures. They're, they're interesting looking. Like you can just look at them and you're just like, what about, well, like, it's, they're interesting creatures. Um, so yeah, those are probably, I know that I didn't really pick a concise answer. There's a lot, but I, I guess I would say black and white warbler. I mean, I think for me that answer changes every week because there are, I mean, every bird is so cool. I think um, one I'm really excited to work on because I just had this idea for this piece. Um, I have a friend that works at a zoo that has um, Tevita weavers or Tevita weavers. They're, um, they're a small yellow, um, yellow and brown weaver and weavers make really cool nests. Um, so with all those like woven grasses and stuff, um, they're, you know, they're like little works of art, little baskets. So I think, I think for this week, that's my, that's my favorite bird this week. Next week it'll change. <laughs> All right, I just want to thank everybody again for signing on and listening to this awesome webinar. All three of you just had fantastic presentations. I learned so much. Um, just a reminder that this webinar was recorded and we will be uploading it to YouTube. We'll send out an email, a follow-up email with hopefully the YouTube link, but definitely resources. Um, and we'll be sharing that YouTube link when we get it up. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again, everybody. And this was great. I think we hit over 150 guests. So that's really huge. And thank you so much for donating. It really, it's really great to, to see all this support. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Have a good thank night you. and a good weekend. Thank you guys Sorry so much. Sorry we didn't get all the questions. Uh, <laughs> thank you.